let's just start reading in verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. The Bible says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, those that die without God and burn in hell, to them that perish, foolishness. Foolishness. What we're doing this morning to the world is foolishness. But unto us which are saved, if you're saved this morning, that's you, the gospel, the preaching of the cross, is the power of God. Right. Power of God. Now, let's skip on down to verse number 22. The apostle Paul said this. He said, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Notice that. The Jews look for a sign, but the Greeks, well, they seek after wisdom. Now watch verse number 23. He said, but our message ain't going to change for the Jew or the Greek. It's going to be the same for everybody. But we preach Christ crucified. Amen right there. Unto the Jews, it's a stumbling block. Right. And unto the Greeks, it's foolishness. Unto the Jews, it's a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks, foolishness. The same message, the same gospel, received two totally different ways. So last Sunday, we started talking about how to uh, be effective and evangelize a secular society. And we talked about you've got to have the right foundation if you're going to evangelize today's Society, you need the right foundation. What foundation are we standing on? We're standing on the Word of God. They're standing on man's Word. We're going to stand on God's Word. And what they'll do is they'll say, well, if you stand on God's Word, then you're being biased. And, and they're always standing on something. Even an atheist that says there is no God, that is religion. They're standing on some type of religion. Whether they worship a God that they don't know, a God they can't see, whether they worship science or themselves, they still have a religion. And for anybody to tell me that we're here today because of a big bang accident and everything you see is a big accident, they're dumber than a box of rocks. I, I would fall more in line with the intelligent design theology before I would it all happen by accident. And uh, we're, we're living in some crazy, crazy days. But you say something crazy like that, you want men to? They applaud you. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And that's what we're seeing today in this hour in which we live. But you've got to have the right foundation. What was the second one? We had the right foundation and the right communication. You gotta be at, we got to be able to understand what they understand. They need to be able to understand what we understand. And so that's where we want to pick up today because you've got to have the right foundation. You've got to have the right communication. But then you need the right application. You got to have the right application. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse number 23, the Apostle Paul said this. He said, the preaching of the cross was what to the Greeks? Greeks, foolishness. But unto the Jews, stumbling block. Those two texts, those two, those two uh, separate units, you're going to find in Acts chapter number 2, that's where we're going to go in just a second, and then Acts 17. Now I want you to get this in your mind if you could before we start. Acts chapter number 2 is to the Jew. Acts chapter number 17, it's to the Greeks. Two sermons by two preachers with two different audiences with two totally different results. One was the Apostle Peter, that's in Acts chapter 2. And then one is in Acts 17, which is the Apostle Paul. Peter preached to the Jews. Paul preached to the Greeks. One of these days, I'm going to preach a sermon. I want to, I'd love to preach a sermon on why Paul could never be Peter. Why Paul could never be Peter. Paul had some converts. Peter had about 3,000. Why Paul could never be Peter. And maybe you can understand a little bit of it this morning.
I want to look in the book of Acts chapter number 2. Let's look at the first sermon by the first preacher by the name of Peter. Now, this is having the right application. you got to have the right communication, but you got to have the right application. Who are you preaching to? Who is the audience? Well, in Acts chapter number 2, let's read it. Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and it filled the house where they were all sitting and you know the story about how the Holy Ghost descended look at verse number 14 the Bible said in verse number 14 but Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them ye men of Judea who's he preaching to? Jews not Greeks, Jews he said ye men of Judea and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. Now watch what he said. He said in verse number 22, ye men of Israel, hear these words. He said, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God. Can I get a witness right there? A man right there. A man approved of God among you. He was a Jew just like you were by miracles and wonders and signs. He was approved by God. Jews seek for a sign. Which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. Watch verse number 23 and verse 24. Him being delivered by determined counsel and the foreknowledge of God. So not only was it the counsel of, of you that was determined, but also the foreknowledge of God. He said this to the Jews that were standing around listening to him preach. He said, ye have taken and by wicked hands you have crucified and have slain him. Y'all killed Messiah. Right. How in the world did he have 3,000 converts when he got up there and blew them out? Y'all killed Jesus. Your hands are dripping in blood. Verse number 24. Whom God hath raised up. So not only did he say, y'all killed him, you crucified Jesus, but he got up. He's alive. He preaches the resurrection having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding it. Verse number 37. Now watch what the Bible says. What, here's the results. Are you ready? Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. <laughs> you know, it's good to go to church and actually feel something. You know, you ain't saved on feelings. But look up in here, if the gospel's being preached, the truth's being given, and God's word's going forth, it's going to do some cutting, slicing, and dicing, and they were pricked to the heart. Amen. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Isn't that wonderful to be able to stand in front of a group of people, no telling, probably 5,000 people, and say, you bunch of sorry dogs. Bless God, every one of y'all killed Jesus. You put him on the cross, and it's your fault that he died. You know what kind of preaching we need today? It's your fault that he was put on the cross. He died because of your sins. He went to Calvary because of your sins, but God raised him up again. And the Bible said they were pricked to the heart, and they said this, what shall we do? We need, we need help. We got to get some help up in here. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now let's look on down if we would in verse number 41. You ready? Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 
souls. 3,000 souls. In other words, the gospel was preached to thousands. Thousands of people were saved. And the culture was affected and effective because of the gospel. So if I could use this term this morning with you, let's call it the Acts 2 approach to evangelism. The Acts 2 approach to evangelism. Now, Law, I got a picture for you. The first picture is Peter preaching unto these people. I want you to notice, who was Peter preaching to? Who was he talking to? Peter stood up in front of thousands of people, and he's preaching to Jews. Jews. Now, notice Peter's gospel. Remember last week we said the gospel in three words? You've got the foundation part of the gospel, which is Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 11. Then you've got the power of the gospel. That's Jesus Christ coming to the world, saved man from his sins. And then there's the hope of the gospel, the new heavens and the new earth. Well, notice the foundation the Jews had. God is the creator. And because man sinned, death entered in, these Jews had the right foundation. They had the right word of God. They knew the message that Moses preached. They remember the Ten Commandments. They remember that Moses wrote Genesis in the beginning God. They believed in God Jehovah. They believed in Yahweh. They believed in Yeshua. They knew, they knew who God was. And these Jews were convinced of every, uh, or they were convinced of every familiar way of the Jewish religion. They were steeped in the Jewish religion. And at this stage in their history, the question is, did they believe in the same God that Peter was preaching about? And the answer would be yes. They believed in God. They just had a problem with Jesus. So when Peter said God... When he mentioned the word God and Peter said God, when he said that while he was preaching, their mind immediately went to the same God that he was talking about. Elohim, El Shaddai, Adonai, Yahweh, Creator. He had the right communication. He had the right foundation. And he also was preaching in the right application. They knew who God was. And so when, when Peter said God, they didn't, he didn't have to define who God was. He didn't have to assume that they were thinking of anybody else other than the God of creation. The God that Peter understood is the God that they understood. Matter of fact, let me put it to you like this. When Peter said sin, he didn't have to define sin. The Jewish people had the law of Moses. They knew what sin was. They knew what lying was and idolatry and stealing and murder and adultery. And they didn't have a problem with the foundational knowledge that was based in Genesis. Right. They believed in Adam and Eve and the fall of man. I got another picture. These Jews, they had the right starting point to be able to hear and understand and accept the gospel. And when you've got the right starting point, that puts you on the right road. But here's what happened. You've got Genesis. That's the right starting point. The right road from Genesis is God's word. But I want you to notice what happened to the Jews when they heard the message of the cross. What was it? The stumbling block. They had the right starting point. They had the right road. And then the gospel was preached. And they said, ouch. They were pricked in their heart. It was, a st it was a stumbling block for them. And because they had the right foundation, because they had the right road, and because they knew the God, they, they could understand and be able to get the gospel message. They had the right foundation. Peter's same foundation they had. Here's the analogy that I could give you this morning. It'd be like trying to build a beautiful building and the foundation was already laid and it was already poured. And all you got to do is walk in and build the building. 
You know, it takes weeks, sometimes months to lay a foundation for a property, but it only takes weeks, sometimes even days if you work long and hard enough to actually build the structure. I remember when I worked in the printing company, um, the company kept getting bigger. They had small printing presses and then they kept getting bigger, bigger, bigger printing presses. And I'll never forget it. We went and the, the owner found this new location. He said, this is the spot we need. This is, this is where we want to be located. And he said, and I'm going to put a brand new printing press in this facility. Well, you know what happened? When we got there, they had to go all the way back to the archives to when the, building was, when the building was built and they had to understand the foundation of the building because the printing press that he was bringing in was so heavy, if they'd have laid it on the foundation that that warehouse was built on, it would have busted that concrete all to pieces. They had to literally come in there and they had to dig out a section of floor where that printing press was going to sit and they had to pour the foundation even deeper. Are you aware of the fact that the foundation the airplanes land on is a little bit thicker than the foundation your car drives on? Right. Takes a long time to get a runway poured because the foundation is the key element to building any type of structure. I remember when Manda's dad was wanting to build a shop, he was requesting some help. And I thought we were going to go down there and I thought I was going to help hold two boards together while he nailed them. But when I got down there, he started handing me these big old long poles of, they call it rebarb. Yeah. <laughs> Rusty and nasty and we got my hands dirty. And uh, I said, I need some gloves. I'm going to get my hands dirty. And I went down there and I remember coming up and I said, Mickey, I said, I thought we were building a shop. He said, yeah, I need your help for the foundation. I said, how hard is it just to pour uh, concrete or throw some rock down and build your building? He said, Adam, you get, we got to dig the footers. And then we got to pour the foundation. And then after he poured the foundation, he said, now we've got to lay rebar so that when they pour the rock and the foundation, the equipment that I bring in, don't bust up my foundation. We spent more time on his foundation than they did on his shop. Yep. We'd go down there week after week, month after month, and it would just be a slab down there. He said, I'm still working on the foundation. I'm still working on the foundation. Weeks to lay the foundation. Here's the gospel message. You've got Christ the creator because man sin in the world and which brings in death. Man plus sin brings in death. That's the right foundation. Then there's the power of the gospel. Jesus Christ came to reverse the curse of Adam and Eve. Thank God he did. And now we've got a new heaven and a new earth. So Peter didn't have to deal with the foundational issue. All he had to deal with was the structure. He didn't have to lay the foundation when he preached. All he had to do was get up and say, Jesus Christ is the key. He's the answer. He, the Messiah, the one that you killed, got up on the third day and 3,000 got saved. Did you know that in America, back in the early 50s, we used to have revivals and there was a preacher that was holding open air meetings by the name of Billy Graham. Billy Graham would set up a tent. Look at this. I, I found this picture. I thought this would be pretty, pretty cool. Hundreds of churches uniting. This is back in the, in the early 50s. Greater Los Angeles Revival. When's the last time you heard California have a revival? And then let's see the photo of the crowds that would show up to hear him preach the gospel. And, and you know, and listen... I, there's a lot of controversy surrounding, you know, his latter days and how he changed and flip-flopped. But did you know that back in the 50s, back in the 40s and the 50s and the early 60s, when the man would get up and preach the gospel, there would be thousands of converts. Thousands. People coming to Christ. They would weep their way. You know why? He had an Acts 2 approach to the gospel. You know why he was so powerful? Why, he, why the message of the gospel was so powerful in the 50s and the 60s? You know why he had such great results? Because Billy Graham didn't have to preach on the foundation. He took an Acts 2 approach and he preached the power and the hope of the gospel and you're a sinner trusting Jesus. And did you know that if him or his son were to run the same kind of crusades today, it would not have an effect on the culture? 
people, people say this all the time. So why was it so powerful in the 50s and 60s? And why, why, why is it not powerful today? Is it because that the gospel's lost its power? Is it because Jesus has lost his power? Here's the reason why he was so powerful back in the 50s and 60s. It was because America used to have prayer in schools. Public schools. Public schools. You know, they would, they would open up in a word of prayer in public schools. And, they, and guess who they would pray to? They would pray to the God of the universe, the Creator. And they would pray to our God, our Lord, our Creator. And they would open up in these prayers and then they would recite, some schools would even recite the Lord's Prayer. I heard, I heard stories about my dad and my granddad telling me, we remember when we were taught Bible verses for reading literature. And then all of a sudden you have generations of kids and you've got generations of adults that are being brought up in America and they're hearing that you're a sinner. And that because of man's sin, because of Adam and Eve, and because of the fall in the garden, and, and they laid the foundation. Churches used to have vacation Bible school, and man, the schools would empty out to go to the church's vacation Bible schools. Everybody knew the gospel. And because America used to have prayer in school, and the Bible used to be the textbook for reading, learning, hey, and even arithmetic. There was only a need for private schools after they removed God from the public school. And even back then, America used to use and base its morality on the Bible and the Ten Commandments. In the 50s and 60s, everybody knew who God was. Everybody knew the, the God of the Bible. When you mentioned God in the 50s and 60s, they knew which God you were talking about. They knew Adam and Eve. They knew sin. They knew Jesus. They knew the cross. So when you had the 50s and the 60s, America was an Acts 2 type culture. Let's put it like this. And I, and I hate to use this terminology, but this, this will kind of develop the thought, the mentality for the rest of the sermon this morning. Acts chapter number 2 were Jews. Acts 17 were Greeks. America used to be Jew. We used to have that foundational experience. We used to understand what was going on. And that was the culture. And you, know, and you could take an Acts 2 approach to evangelize and work the society and people understood it. But today, what's the problem? What's the problem today? Creation is removed from the schools. They laugh about it. There's more negative ads over the ark that's being built in northern Kentucky than there is positive ads. Creation being removed from the schools and creation being removed from the colleges and from the churches. It's being removed from the churches. Right. Think about that. We've got doctors and people in ministry and PhD saying that they believe in a gap theory. They don't believe in a six literal day creation. God said on the first day, on the second, God numbered them. On the third day, on the fourth day, on the fifth day, God laid this out. But we've raised a generation and we've raised a society that has removed prayer from school. We've removed the Bible from the school. And in the 50s and 60s, when you said God, most people knew the God of the Bible. But if you say the word God today, the response is, which God? Are you talking about the Hindu God? Are you talking about the Buddhist God? Are you talking about the Shinto God? Are you talking about the Muslim God? Are you talking about the New Age God? Or are you talking about the unknown God? That's the atheist God. The unknown God. America is no longer an axe to culture. I was listening to the news this past week and people are saying, what are we going to do? I mean, people now just picking up guns and shooting, killing police officers. Did you know that there's been more cops killed this past week than there has been since 9-11? This week? 
Did you know one got shot in Georgia? One got shot in Tennessee? One was shot, I, I heard, over in uh, South Carolina, up in, up in Michigan, officers being shot at, targeted. And, and, they, and you know what they say? Well, if there was a God, that he wouldn't allow all these bad things to happen. Look up in here, Jack. Y'all kicked him out of the country back in the 50s and 60s. You kicked him out of our school system. And now we've got, we've got a bunch of wild, crazy lunatics that has never heard the gospel. They don't know who God is. They don't know who Jesus is. And they're running the country. They're running the country. And I don't know if you still have that statement from the book, from uh, the, the book that our president wrote, but what was it he said? He said, we're no longer a Christian nation. We're no longer, he said, he said, whatever we once, whatever we once were, we are no longer. He won't even admit we were a Christian nation at one time. We're, you know what they want to call, you know what America truly is wanting to become? They're wanting to become Greeks. They want America to become the melting pot for all religions. And I'm going to be honest with you. When you do that, you go from an Acts 2 society to an Acts 17 society. An Acts 17 approach is needed for an Acts 17 culture. And I'm going to show that to you here in just a little bit. So I'm going to take about a 15-minute break. Let everybody go get some water, go to the restroom. I'm going to pick up because I, I really wanted to take my time on this and really lay this out for you because I want to bring, at the end of it, I want to, I want to bring in on who could be possibly the next Billy Graham of our day. I've heard that all my life. Who's the next Billy Graham? It's found in Acts 17 found in Acts 17. Bling block. But under the Greeks it's foolishness. We preach Christ crucified but under the Jews it's a stumbling block. Under the Greeks it's foolishness. Acts chapter number 2 and Acts chapter number 17 is where we'll be at the latter part of this morning. In Acts chapter number 2 you had a Jewish society that Peter preached to and had 3,000 converts. The Bible said about 3,000. But when you come to Acts 17, the Apostle Paul preached the same exact message that Peter preached. And the Bible said some believed. What was the difference? Was it because the gospel had lost its power? And I've been dealing with how to have an effective evangelistic approach in a secular society. And we are a secular society today. And it's what Barack Obama said in his book that he wrote, I believe back in 2008, when he said, whatever we once were, we are no longer. We're no longer a Christian nation. We're a, we're, we're a Buddhist nation, a Hindu nation, a nation of different gods and different set of beliefs. And I believe it. If you don't believe that, go to the Mall of Georgia. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe that, go down to Discover Miss Sugarloaf Mills. They change the name every year. Go to a mall. You'll find out we are a melting pot. Yep. We are a melting pot. And we have forsaken the principles and the foundation on which this country was built and established. And so we need to have the right foundation if you're going to evangelize correctly. You're going to have to have the right communication, but you're also going to have the right application. And Peter was applying a gospel message. He took an Acts 2 approach to the culture of Acts chapter number 2. And the Bible said this, the Bible said that when he preached, Peter standing up with the 11, he preached... And he said in verse number 23, he said, It's you that have killed Jesus. It's you that have taken him and put him on the cross. But God raised him from the dead. Verse number 37, they were pricked in their heart. Right. And I've got, a, I've got a picture of this. They had the right starting point, which is Genesis. They believed the law of Moses. The Jews believed in Adam and Eve and sin into the world. They had the right starting point which put them on the right road, and then when the gospel's preached, when you're on the right road, what is, it, what is it to the Jew? A stumbling block. They were pricked in their heart. They said, ouch. 
We, you mean we killed Jesus? We killed the Messiah? And man, God moved in a mighty way and 3,000 were added to the church. Two sermons by two preachers, two audiences, two totally different results. So that's where we left off this morning was in Acts chapter number 2. Peter didn't have to explain who God was in Acts chapter number 2. When Peter said God, they, the people that he was preaching to, those Jews of that day, they knew it was Yahweh. They knew it was Yeshua. They knew it was uh, El Shaddai. They knew it was Elohim. They knew it was Adonai. They knew him as Creator. Right. And I said this, that in the 1950s and in the 1960s, America was an Acts 2 culture. We too could say the word God and people would understand who God was. We used to have prayer in school. We used to have Bibles for literature in our school systems. But what we've done is we've stripped God out. We've taken God out. So nowadays when you say in, an act, when you say in this culture today that we live in and you say uh, God, they'll look at you and say, which God are you talking about? You're talking about the Church of Scientology's God. You're talking about the Hindu God, Vishnu, Brahma. Who are you talking about? Right. Are you talking about Satan? Because he's our God. We're removing the Ten Commandments, but we're putting up satanic images across the country. Which God are you talking about? When you mention sin in this society, they don't even know what sin is. Because there was a time when America used the Bible to base its morality. But we've moved to an we've moved to an area, a culture that is based on moral relativism, which means you know it's relative to the culture, it's relative to the society, and you know if we elect a bunch of conservatives, then the morals change. Then if we elect a bunch of Democrats, the morals will go negative, and they'll 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 change. And then we got to get conservatives back in. What you need is a basis of the Word of God. If the Bible says that adultery is wrong, it's wrong. If the Bible says that sodomy is wrong, then it's wrong. If the Bible says it's wrong to kill a man, then it's wrong. You show me in the Word of God where God ever set up a, a prison system in the Bible. A jail system. That's man's doings. You know why there's less crime in certain parts of the world? Because if you get caught lying, they'll put a hot spoon to your tongue and burn it. Pat you on your back and say, don't you lie again. <laughs> How many remembers the movie Aladdin? I remember when I was a kid, I watched that little cartoon movie Aladdin. You remember in the movie, he went to go steal an apple, and when he went to steal the apple, the guy pulled out a sword, and his hand was required. They still do that to this day. Yep. Disney picks up on that culture. You know why there's not a lot of stealing going on over in those parts of the world? Because they'll chop your, head, they'll chop your hand off, and if you do something really wrong, they'll chop your head off. Right. Every country in the world, you're guilty until proven innocent. You come to America, you're innocent until proven guilty. Do you realize that's contrary to what God teaches in His Bible? Because the Bible teaches that every man is guilty until proven innocent. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of what? The glory of God. We are living in a society where the Bible, the Ten Commandments, and the foundational issues that our country was built on is no longer. And so now the church has become ineffective. And here's what I really believe with all of my heart. The reason that Billy Graham had great crusades in the 50s and 60s, and a lot of people got saved, was because he was preaching to an Acts 2 culture. The kids growed up around the Bible. They grew up around the table where everybody would hold hands and pray before their meal. He could get up and say, you're a sinner, you need Jesus, and people would come. Right. People say, well, they really didn't get saved in those crusades. Let me tell you something. If just 1% of the converts that got saved under Billy Graham were true converts, if just 1% were true, that's more than you'll ever win to God. You're right. That's right. Hey. Years ago, a preacher was preaching up in North Carolina and a guy got up and took him about 30, 45 minutes and he blew out Billy Graham for an hour. Just preached on Billy Graham. At the end of the service, they asked everybody to stand up and one guy stood up and said, I'd like to testify. He said, I've been a member of this church for 42 years. He said, I've been saved by the grace of God. He said, I was saved under a tent years ago. He said, I've not missed a Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night. He said, that I know of in the past 42 years. He said, I was one of Billy's converts. <laughs> 
So let's just say that he did have an impact on the culture. He would show up in Australia and hundreds of thousands of people would flock to these arenas just to hear the message of the gospel. Why was it so popular? Did you know if he did that today in this culture, he couldn't get 100 people under a tent? And even if they did walk down the aisle, it would just be a recommittal. It'd be a recommitment to God. It wouldn't be a true conversion nowadays. And I feel like that's where we're at. We have left the... America is no longer an Acts 2 culture. What set those Jews apart from the Greeks in Acts chapter number 2, I'm fixing to show it to you, those people in Acts 2 had a basic concept and an understanding of what Peter was preaching about. Right. And for the Jews, they had the right starting point. They were on the right road. Therefore, the cross was a stumbling block to them. And America used to be an Acts 2 culture where we could say God and everybody knew we were talking about the Creator. But now there's no such thing as creation. There's no such thing as a global flood. There's no such thing as a real true Bible. Can I tell you what they're doing today? The secularists, the atheists, the agnostics, the scoffers. They are trying their best to suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Yeah, Can I get an amen right there? Yes. And, and you wonder why we're having all these mass killings and we're having these guys go in and shoot cops and kill them. Hey, and everybody says if there really was a God and if God really existed, He wouldn't allow these bad things to happen. Look up in here, Jack. Y'all kicked Him out of the government. You kicked Him out of the school system. You kicked Him out of the homes. And now they've kicked Him out of the churches today. And they don't even preach a literal creation period. They don't preach that man caused the problem that we're in. No one, no wonder they want to blame God for the mess we're in. They don't understand it's man's fault. It's not God's fault. And I'm going to tell you something. For us to get a picture and for us to get a little taste of what life would be like without God, welcome to planet Earth. If you want to know what life would be like without God, welcome to Earth. Amen. Adam and Eve didn't have tsunamis. They didn't have earthquakes. God said, and it was good. He created the mountains, it was good. He created the lakes, it was good. He created everything in six wonderful business. Six 24-hour periods. And God said, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, and it's good. And it was good. But what happened? Man rebelled against God. Y'all remember the snake? Yea, hath God said. And he slithered his way in. We're in a mess because we have... We are a society that is getting more and more depraved because we are pushing God further and further away. Amen. We're no longer in an Acts 2 society where you can just pop up and preach Jesus Christ crucified and 3,000 people get saved. Why are we not seeing the numbers that we're seeing today? Why are we not seeing the, great, the greatness of the Acts 2? It's because we're in Acts 17. Turn there with me. Acts 17. America is no longer Jewish. America is Greek. Yeah. Acts 17. And I want you to look, if you would, in verse number 18. Acts 17 and verse number 18. Peter is... Peter. Paul is preaching the same message as Peter. Right. Jesus Christ crucified, buried, coming again. Life. He's preaching the power... Listen to this. He's preaching the, the found, He's not preaching the foundation. He's preaching the power and he's preaching the hope of the gospel. The power is the crucifixion and the resurrection and the hope of the gospel is what? The new heavens and the new earth. That's what Paul's preaching. Watch what happens in verse 18. Then certain philosophers, certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him, encountered Paul. Now watch what the Bible says. And some said... What will this babbler say? What's all this babbling? We've never heard such mess in all of our days. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He's preaching in Acts 17. And they said, listen to all this babbling. This babbling. Others, some, he seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods. There were some that were trying to relate to the message, but when he said God, he said Jesus, that was a strange little G God. Because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. 
Verse 20, For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, that we should know thereof what these things mean. For all the Arthenians, the strangers which were there, spent their time and nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Paul was preaching to a totally different culture. The Greeks had gods and goddesses. Right. The Jews had God. Right. Elohim, El Shaddai, the Creator. But the Greeks, they had all these gods. They had all these goddesses. Some of them were male, some of them were female. Remember what 1 Corinthians 1.23 says? Unto the Jews it was a what? Stumbling block. Under the 40s and the 50s and the 60s here in America, the message of the gospel was a stumbling block. But what did it say under the Greeks? The preaching was foolishness. Why the difference is the question. Why was it a stumbling block to the Jews, but when Paul preached the same message under the Greek philosophers, why did they not believe it? Why did they say, yeah, what's up with this babbler, this foolish man? Let me give you a real quick background this morning. The Epicureans, they, everything, they, they believed that everything evolved from the earth. You know what they were? They were evolutionists. Yes. That's the, uh, go study Wikipedia, Wikipedia will tell you this, I can't believe it, I looked it up and it was true, but the Epicureans, they believed that man, that everything evolved from the earth. There was no God, there was no creator, that everything come from the earth. And we live in a generation today that believes that Darwin invented evolution. Honey, it's been around since the Apostle Paul. Right. It's been around since Paul. It's the same lie Satan said in the garden. He said, if you'll eat of the fruit, ye shall be like gods. I played a couple of weeks ago a video of a guy, a scientist saying, one of these days we shall be like God. That's what they want to be. Because when there is no God, they can become God. Darwin didn't invent the idea of evolution. He just made it popular through his books and through his literature. The Greeks believed in many gods. And Paul couldn't even use the word God when he preached to the Epicureans. He, when he talked to the Stoics, listen to this, the Stoics, you know what they believed? They were pantheists. In other words, that was another word for everything evolved from the earth. They believed the same thing that the Epicureans believed. They believed everything evolved from the earth. They were evolutionists. And so Paul was preaching to a culture that had no foundation to understand a gospel message. Right. right. Amen. I got a photo I want to show you. The Greeks were on a totally different road than what the Jews were on. Notice they didn't have the same starting point the Jews had. The Greeks, when Paul preached the gospel, notice, notice the path of the, of the Greek here. He's got his own path. It crosses over the right path, the right road. And so Paul preaches the same message Peter does. But look at what happens. They look back and the Greeks say, that's, fool that's foolish. Why does man need a savior when man ain't done nothing wrong? How are you going to preach the gospel effectively without Genesis 1 to 11? How are you going to tell people that they're a sinner in need of a God? We are living in an Acts 2 culture. That's what they think of the church. Foolish. It's not a stumbling block anymore. Because we have allowed society and we have allowed man to take the place of God and we've changed from God's word to man's word. Amen. The Greeks were on a totally different road with a, with a whole different starting point. And when you have a totally different starting point, this is what I've been dealing with for the last four or five weeks. When you have a totally different starting point, you have a totally different worldview. Right. That's why over here you've got Bill Nye the science guy. He's on the Greek road. And then over here you've got Dr. Ken Ham and Christians. We're on the Jewish road. We believe in Genesis. I hope you do. 
And because we believe Genesis, we believe the Word of God to be literal and true. We believe God's Word. We have a different worldview than what they have. Amen. That's why we'll never jihad. We'll never get together. But what the church has done is they've taken the theology of evolution and tried to fit it in the Bible. They've tried to, and they come up with gap theory. They've tried to take millions of years and this false doctrine and these lies that we've been here for millions and billions of years and try to fit it into the Word of God and you wonder why people have left the church and the church is now going downhill? It's because the, the church don't even stand on their own Word of God. They've got so many different versions, it's pathetic. You're right. 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 Amen. Amen. They changed their stance. Now here's the thing this morning. If you want a Greek in this society, we have, I believe we're in Acts, Acts 17, and if you want a Greek to understand the message of the gospel and to understand the cross, you've got to do something. You've got to get him off the wrong road. You've got to give him a whole new starting point. You've got to give him the right history. You've got to give him the right foundation. And the right road will lead to the cross. Amen. Right. Right. Guess what? That's exactly what Paul did. That's why Paul could never be Peter. Peter preached the power and the hope of the gospel. 3,000 get saved, added to the church. Paul preaches the same thing and they say, you're, you're a babbler. What, what God are you talking about? And Paul understood, if I'm going to reach these Greeks, I've got to turn these Greeks into Jews. Mm -hmm. You're not going to reach anybody unless y'all have got the same foundation. When you tell somebody you believe in God and go to church, you could be Buddhist for all they know. Right. You could be Hindu. You gotta get, you've got to talk to them about who God really is. How many's got your Bibles? Acts chapter number 17, verse number 22. Here it is. So Paul gets accused of babbling. He gets accused of speaking about weird, false God. They've never heard of these gods before, these Greeks. They're all scratching their head. Acts 22, watch what the Bible says. Then Paul stood up in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Y'all are crazy. <laughs> you think I'm crazy? Y'all are crazy. I mean, way too... They had a God for the moon. They had a God for the sun. They had a God for the wind. They had a God for the air. They had a God for the ground. They had a God for the sky. They had a God for the stars. They had a God for the... Every... They had gods for everything. Paul said, for as I passed by Athens, as I was here, I beheld your devotions. I beheld your, your devotions, your churches, your gods. He said, and you know what I came across? I came across an altar with the inscription to the what? Unknown God. Now I'm going to tell you something. Paul was slick as you... I'm talking... Paul was slick. Oh, Paul said, I was walking through and I found a God that I don't know who he is. You call him the unknown God. He said, but I tell you what, of whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Y'all don't know who the unknown God is? I do. <laughs> Whoa, it is smart little. I mean, he, he could have ran for president. He said, I know who the unknown God is. Y'all don't know who he is, but I do. You want to know who he is? Well, they've already got 20 or 30 or 40 anyway. Why do not just hear about one more? They're open now. He got them. He's slick, ain't he? He said, let me tell you who your unknown God is. He said, he is the God. Notice verse 24, capital G. He's the God that made the world. <laughs> you know what he did? He went back to Genesis chapter 1. He's going to walk him through to chapter number 11. Right? Paul said, you know how I'm going to reach these Greeks? You know how I'm going to turn these Greeks into Jews? I'm taking them all the way back to the beginning. I'm going to give them a new starting point. I'm putting them on the right road. Amen. 
God, my, my, I feel like preaching. He said, the God that made the world, that's the unknown God. And all the things that are therein, that's that God. Seeing that He is Lord. Oh, let me tell you about this God. He's bigger than all your gods combined. He's Lord. He's God. I feel like preaching. He's the Lord of heaven. He's the Lord of earth. And guess what? He dwelleth not in temples made with hands. In other words, y'all can't bind him. He's not of this world. He's not from the, the Epicureans and the Stoics were going, ooh, oh, this is a unique God. We weren't able to create Him with our hands or our minds. This is a God that we don't know who He is, but we know that He does exist. And, and Paul's laying the foundation here. And he said, neither is worship with men's hands as though He has needed anything, seeing He giveth to all life and breath and all things. Yeah, it covers it all, don't it? Can I tell you a little bit more about this unknown God? He's the God that hath made one blood. All nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation and they that should seek the Lord if they happily they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. He's close. <laughs> Whoa! For in him we live and move and have our being as certain as of your own poets have said. For we are also his offspring for much then as we are the offspring of God. We ought not to think of the Godhead is like unto gold, silver, or stone, or graven by art and man's device. No graven images. No graven images. He's quoting Deuteronomy. No graven images. Yeah. No gold calf. We're not worshiping a gold calf. We're not worshiping Baal. I'm telling you, he's taking them and putting them on the right path. Amen. And at times of this ignorance, God winked at it. The God I'm talking about, he winked at it. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That's it. Hallelujah. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he also hath ordained, whereof he hath given him assurance to all men that he hath raised him from the dead. Now he's preaching Jesus. Yes. God's son. Can I let you in a little secret? They're listening. Mm -hmm. They're not talking about what, what's all this babbling. He picked one of their gods that they didn't know and said, let me tell you who that God is. <laughs> By the way, he wasn't lying either. He was the unknown God to the Greeks. <laughs> he, they didn't know the God of Yahweh. They didn't know the God of creation. All they knew was the Aphrodite God and the Zeus God and the Athena God and the Apollo God. That's what they believed. And they didn't have the right foundation. They did not have the right... They wasn't standing on the same gospel. And so guess what Paul's doing? Paul went in there with a gospel plow. Paul went in there with a stick of dynamite. And he took that gospel dynamite and he blew up the ground and the foundation they were standing on and he declared unto them the true God, the living God, the only God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob and he declared unto them Jesus Christ, buried, resurrected, praise God. He gave them the right foundation. Amen. Watch what the Bible says. Verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, here it is. Some mocked. All but others. <laughs> uh, the results are getting a little bit better. The results are getting better than what I just read in the first part of chapter 17. Others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. Amen. We want to know more. 
That's what man's doing. He's searching. Yep. And, he, and that's why he goes to, to drugs and alcohol, alternate lifestyle. They're searching for that missing piece of their life. His name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. Others said, we will hear thee again. And the Bible said in verse 33, so Paul departed from among them. Wait, wait. Here it is. How be it? Certain men clave unto him. And what does the Bible say? And they believed. After he got them off the wrong path and put them on the right road, Paul took them to the Acts 2 approach. And the numbers went from all everybody mocking, what's this babbler saying, to some were saying, let's hear it again. And the Bible said some of the Greeks were actually converted into some Jews. Some believed. Imagine if you wanted to go build a house this, this week and you get the floor plan for your house. And you say, this is the perfect house, this is the house we want. And then you go and you hire a team of construction people and they build the foundation, they lay the foundation. It takes weeks, months to build the foundation for your home. And then the city inspector comes out to your house or the local county government official and he looks at the floor plans and then he looks at the foundation and he says, wait a minute. You can't build a house here. Why not? That's the wrong foundation. Imagine how you would feel on the inside. When, you, when it hits you, I'm not going to be able to build the house. I'm going to have to turn around and dig up everything that we've been working on. I've got to dig up this whole foundation. I've got to start all over again before I can even start laying the sticks for my house. Are you aware that Peter, when he preached to the 3,000, they had the right foundation and he went right, into the, he went right into the structure and he went right into preaching the house and preaching the gospel and the power of God was real and 3,000 converts got saved. But when Paul showed up, their foundation wasn't going to work with the message he had. What kind of babbling is this? And God used Paul to do something I believe Peter couldn't do. Does anybody know who Paul was before he got saved? He was a Jewish theologian. He was a man that was actually taking people and persecuting the church because he didn't believe in what the church was doing. He didn't accept the message of the cross. He was in that Judaism. He was a, he was a devout Jew. He was part of the crowd that put Jesus on the cross. He was part of the crowd that stoned Stephen. He was there when they stoned Stephen. He applauded the death of the first martyr in the Bible. He knew the religion. And that's why God raised him up. He raised up a lawyer a doctor, a psychologist. Paul was a unique man. And Paul walked into Athens. He walked into Greece and he took a plow and he took a shovel and he dug up the foundation that they had. And then he poured in Genesis chapter 1 through chapter number 11. And then he preached the gospel. Amen. <laughs> we are living in a different culture today in America. So when the church sends out a gospel tract that says you need God, they go, which God? The church has spent millions of dollars in evangelism and advertisement, but it's not making an effect on the culture. It's because we've raised a culture that don't know God. Are you aware of the fact there's people living in Habersham County that don't know who Jesus is? They don't know who he is. Go to Lowe's during the 11 o'clock worship hour. You'll find a few of them down at Lowe's. They ain't got a clue. Right. And you're not going to reach the Greek with a Jewish approach. And the approach that the church has used for so many years has been an Acts to approach. The power of the gospel. The hope of the gospel. That's all that's being preached. 
But the Greeks say that's just a bunch of babbling nonsense. That's why we're ineffective. We're going to have to start all over again if we're going to be effective in this day and hour in which we live. Amen. We got to. If you want to be effective. You got to get them off the wrong road and you got to get them on the right path. America, under the Billy Graham crusades, used to be an Acts 2 type culture. And here's the sad part about it there's a lot of good Christian people that grew up, the older generation grew up under that Acts 2 type culture, and they don't understand what's really happening nor the approach that's needed to reach this culture. This culture. Right. America is not Acts 2 anymore. It's Acts 17. You tell somebody they're a sinner, they go, huh? How do you know? If you say God, they say which one? Let me give you some statistics. 90% of church families send their kids to a Greek school system. I got an image for you. What we're doing is we're taking the Christian kids in our churches and we're sending them to a secular school system and we're taking Jews and we're turning them into Greeks. And evangelistically, the church is approaching the world as Jews and not as Greeks. And the church wonders why we're losing our young people and our youth. And the church is not having an effect on the culture that it once had. You know what the church needs to be doing? The church needs to be taking Greeks and turning them into Jews. You realize one of our founding presidents, one of our former presidents, had a disease and they thought the only way to get rid of the disease was to bleed him. Was it Washington? Yes, Washington. They were going to bleed him and get that unclean blood out. Do you realize if they had just read the Bible where it said the life of the flesh is in the blood, he might not have died? It's a science book. It's a science book. But what we've done is we've removed the science book from the school system and we said this is what man says, this is what man's word says, this is what new modern technology says, God's word's old and it's outdated and we've, re we've raised a generation and we're taking the kids today and we're turning them into a bunch of Greeks and it's getting worse. I'm going to tell you something, the church has been infiltrated by Greeks. You ask anybody today that's got a doctorate degree in theology on a six-day creation and they'll step, step, stutter and pop, 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 sound like a Harley Davidson trying to crank up. Six days. Six days. Matter of fact, God created it so good in six days, it took him 40 days just to destroy it. <laughs> and 40 nights I said God did such a good job creating this thing in six business days that it took him 40 days to destroy it Amen. I said he done such a good job creating this thing in six days it took him 40 days and 40 nights to destroy it Amen. I said that he done such a great job creating this planet and this earth. It took him 40 days and 40 nights to wipe it all away. Amen. <laughs> you know what I've been heard? I, I hear this all the time today. People ask today. Do you think there'll be another Billy Graham? Do you think there'll be another, God will raise up another Billy Graham in this generation, in this society? Can I make a bold prediction to you? There will not be another Billy Graham in this current culture. An Acts 2 approach does not work in an Acts 17 society. Paul proved it. 
I want you to turn over to the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 10. And I want to look at verse number 2, and then I'm going to play a video, and then we'll go home. Jeremiah, chapter number 10. This is probably where all your pages were stuck together, but I want you to look at Jeremiah 10. Does everybody get it? Does everybody see what's going on? We're not Acts 2 anymore. You can't just go out and preach the gospel. They don't know what it is. They're on the wrong road. It's foolishness. And unless you're able to dig up the road they're on and blow it up with a stick of dynamite and put them on the right road and they hear the right message and they go the right direction, that's the only way the cross will ever become a stumbling block for a Greek. Our job as the church is to affect the Greeks. And by the way, the results are not as great as if everybody had the right foundation. Jeremiah chapter number 10 and verse number 2. Thus saith the Lord. In other words, God says this, not brother Adam. Learn not the way of the heathen. Get your kids out of public school, bless God. Learn not the way of the heathen. Stop sending them down there to the atheist to tell them there is no God and we're all from monkeys. They'll grow up one day trying to figure out if they're a boy or a girl or if they're a male or female or which bathroom to go in. They'll grow up not knowing the definition of what marriage is. We're taking Jews, turn them into Greeks. Jeremiah said, learn not the way of the heathen. And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the, dis, for the heathen are dismayed of, or are dismayed at them. You know what we need to be doing? The church needs to be invading the Greeks. The church needs to be invading society. And what's so crazy is today in 2016... If you walk into an average public school and you preach a creation message or you give a creation scientifically date age method and lay it out for them, it will be something new that they've never even heard of. It's, it's, that's how old it is. It's so old that it's new. the Sunday school material that I purchased to go through this series on Answers in Genesis came from Answers in Genesis. And uh, Dr. Ken Ham, they just finished the ark in northern Kentucky. Hopefully when they get the zip lines up and running, I'm going to take my kids. (laughs) Let them have some fun. But I want to play for you a video of the private ceremony in Kentucky just this past week it was July the 7th by the way July is the 7th month and did you know Genesis 7 7 says that's when God asked Noah and his family to enter the ark that's why they had July 7th the 7th month on the 7th day they let people enter the ark Genesis 7 7 look it up that's when Noah went into the ark amen They had congressmen there. They had senators there. They had people over down there. There were thousands and thousands of people that showed up at the ark for the ribbon cutting. Now, I said this before. People wonder, is God going to raise up another Billy Graham? Is God going to have another great crusade? Well, how many remembers the Billy Graham crusades back in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s? There was a man that used to come out and sing before he preached. Does anybody know his name? Who? George Beverly Shea. Is it on air? He might have sang something like this before the Crusades. Before they cut the ribbon, they asked her to sing.
has made. What a testimony. What a testimony. And I see the stars. And I hear the rolling thunder. Turn it down just a bit. Here's what I want to say. George Beverly Shea is not here. Billy Graham's crusades are over. But the Spirit of God lives on. And we're living in a secularized culture that says there is no God. And the only way you're going to be able to effectively reach a Greek. You got to have the right foundation, the right communication, and unfortunately, it's going to take the right application. You say, what do you mean by that? 
they're estimating anywhere between 1.2 and 2.2 million people a year will walk through the ark in northern Kentucky. Amen. And it's more than just an ark. Sun. It's an exhibit that starts with creation and walks you all the way through to the cross. Wow. And when they present the gospel at the end, a light bulb goes off in the Greeks and they go, oh, wow. I got a photo I want to share with you before we dismiss this morning. He said he would never step foot in the ark. But just this past week, it made headline news all across the internet. Mr. Bill Nye, the science guy, was personally invited by Dr. Ken Ham to take a personal tour through Noah's Ark that didn't ever exist. Yeah, man. And Mr. Nye was presented the gospel. In a whole do he wasn't on a church pew, he wasn't listed as a preacher, but he it was laid out for him in a scientific way. Dr. Kenham said, You're looking for the unknown God, you're looking for the God particle. That's what they're doing at CERN. They're looking for the God particle. How did it start? We want to know more. And he brought him to the ark. And he said, I want to reveal to you, Mr. Nye, the unknown God. By the way, when they opened the ark in northern Kentucky, it was during severe flooding. Amen. You tell me there's not a God in heaven. There's severe flooding. Now, a lot of people couldn't make it to the cer private ceremony because their houses were underwater. That's very good. Wonder who orchestrated that? Global warming? Hillary Clinton, Obama, NASA. There's a God in heaven that orchestrate and put together a team of men and they've built the ark, Noah's ark, to the Bible specifics in Genesis chapter number 6. We're going to take our kids. We're going to go visit it. Right now they're offering a 40 day and 40 night pass. To come see the ark. And you know how they let them on, don't you? They let them on two by two. Right in the door. And this is what Mr. Ham said in his testimony before the senators and the congressmen that were there at the private ceremony. He said, it is my desire and it is my goal that 6.8 billion people will walk through the ark and experience the ark encounter. Amen. I want, I want 7 billion people to come to the ark. Is everybody all right? Yeah. You want to talk about a different application? You want, you want to ask me who the next Billy Graham is? He's not going to have near as many converts. But Bill Nye the science guy was on Noah's ark and he said he would never step foot on there. And before he left, before Bill Nye left the ark, Mr. Ham brought him around, set him down, and said, Would it be all right with you, Mr. Nye, if I had a word of prayer with you before you left? He said, I don't care. He's an atheist. He said, I don't care what you do. And Mr. Ham prayed over Bill Nye, the science guy, and said, God, I pray that you would open the eyes of Bill Nye. Amen. What if he were to get saved? God saved Paul, didn't he? Yep. Wasn't he persecuting the church? Yes. He saved Paul, didn't he? Yes. You know why he saved Paul? Because God knew that there was an Acts 17 culture that was right around the corner that Peter would never be able to reach. Yep. Peter didn't know how to uproot the foundation and put him on the right path. Paul did. Yep. That's why Paul will never be Peter. You know what I'm praying that God will do at Heritage Baptist Church? You know what I'm praying God will do through this series? God will raise up a generation of Apostle Pauls that will stand on the Word of God and that will proclaim the Word of God. And look, all we're trying to do is convince a few Greeks. Yep. We're just trying to convince a few Greeks there is a God. We're trying to turn Greeks into Jews. We're trying to take an Acts 17 approach 
to an Acts 17 society. No, I'm not changing my Bible. No, I'm not changing my message. No, I'm not changing the Word. I'm not changing the steeple nor the church. But what I am doing is realizing the world's changed. And they don't even know who God is. They don't know who Jesus is. We got to tell them about Genesis chapter 1 through Genesis chapter number 11. Or we are going to be ineffective in this society that we live in. You know what I thought about, Brother Ken? We ought to take this Bible literally. We ought to believe it literally. The Bible says Jonah was swallowed by a well. I believe it. I, don't, I know Bill O'Reilly don't believe it, but I believe it. And if the Bible says that uh, Jonah swallowed a well, guess what? I'd believe that too. It's in my Bible. That's right. Amen. I believe the Bible. I believe God's Word. I'm a, I'm, I'm a Bible believer, and I believe we're going to take it literally. I believe we're going to take God's Word literally. Can you mute that slideshow of the actual ark that you showed earlier, the minute, 30 seconds? I just want to loop that as we're dismissing. And uh, let me just hit mute up here on this. But here, let, me, let, me just, let, me, let me just tell you what Jesus said in Matthew. Matthew chapter number 24. Jesus told his disciples. He said, do you want to know when the coming of the Son of Man may be? Do you want to know when I'm coming back? you want to know when I'm coming back to this earth? you know when I'm coming back? And they said, when? Tell us, tell us. He said, as it were in the days of? Well, my Lord, he's built an ark in northern Kentucky. <laughs> the atheists are boycotting it they're calling it genocide and incest and they're mocking it and the mockers are here and they're mocking it and they're laughing about it but Jesus said I'm coming back as it were in the days of Noah and by the way I just throw this in he said it'll happen around the last trump <laughs> we got the last trump we've got the ark could it just be any day now the church of the living God checks out of here for worlds unknown? Yes. Amen.